everyone. Welcome back to another live community classroom with Michaels. We have our friend Tamara Kelly with us today to learn how to make the three hour throw. My name is Renee L from Yarn Inspirations and I'll be helping with any questions you might have during today's class. Please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we'll make sure that Tamara answers them. While we're getting ready to kick things off, let us know where you're watching from. Over to you, Tamara. Okay, thanks so much, Renee. Hi, as she said, I'm Tamara from Moogly Blog, and today I'm going to be teaching you how to hand crochet. Now, once you've got the hang of it, you can definitely make one of these throws, which is about 36 inches by 36 inches in about three hours. But when you're just learning a new technique, remember it will take you more time to learn the technique. Don't set a timer tonight. Go ahead, keep practicing the stitches, and when you've got them down, you'll be whipping these blankets out like nobody's business. Now, the key to making a big blanket like this with hand crochet is you've got to have a great big yarn. If you've only got really skinny yarn, it's just going to be, you know, it's going to be too fiddly. You want something you can really get a grip on. So what we're using for this class is Bernat Blanket Big. You can see right here. Um, if you are not able to find Bernat Blanket Big near you, you can also look for Bernat Blanket Extra Thick. But you can see, if I put my hand under it here, just how big and thick this yarn is. So while I tell you a little bit about this, first things first, go ahead and take your label off and start finding the end of your yarn. A lot of times you'll kind of see a little bit tucked into an end, like right there. Keep pulling on that, boom, you've got your end. Otherwise, I know it can take a few minutes, so look for that while we talk about the blanket. Um, first things first, this is, of course, the blanket we're making. You can see here, if you're familiar with knit or crochet, these are kind of big stitches. We're going to be using several fingers to make each one of these stitches. And that adds a lot of drape to our blanket. Some people prefer a much tighter fabric, and to do that, you can definitely use fewer fingers. Um, but for tonight, we're just gonna go ahead and practice these stitches a little bit bigger. And then as you practice and come up with your own comfortable way to hold your hands and your yarn, you can shrink those loops down a little bit if you like for a tighter, um, you know, not as holy or loose blanket, or you could even add more fingers, make it really loose, make it really drapey. It's a really variable pattern, and where in crochet with a hook, we would determine the size of the stitches with the hook, we're going to be determining them with our hands. So as I said, you're going to need some Bernat Blanket Big. So let's go ahead and go to the overhand camera, and we'll take a quick look at this yarn together. <clears throat> now, here's what it looks like, of course, again, Bernat Blanket Big. And again, the big is the part that you really want to emphasize here, because look how big and thick this yarn is. In particular, it is a seven jumbo yarn. So if you haven't done a yarn project before, that number right there, these go zero through seven. It looks like a little skein on the label there. Seven is the biggest one, and that's what you need to make this blanket. Now tonight, we're only going to be using one skein of this yarn to practice with. To make a 36 inch by 36 inch blanket, like I was just holding up, you will need four skeins. Want to go bigger, you'll need more. Want to go smaller, you'll need less. And we can talk about figuring out how much yarn you want to use at the end of this class. So basically, the big thing is you want a nice, big, chunky yarn. For tonight, if you weren't able to get a hold of this yarn, you can take several strands of, say, Bernat Blanket Big and sort of hold them together as if they were one. But you'll want to have a really big one when it comes time to make this blanket. So now I'll go ahead and pull my label off here. And we can pull up quite a few yards. You want to pull up a fair bit because when we're making great big stitches like this, we're going to run right through our yarn. Now I'll set that aside here now that I've got our end. And then right there, we've got the end to our yarn. So the first thing we're going to need to do is make a slip knot. But I want to make sure, I know Renee, I think, already put up the link, but this is the pattern that we're going to be following. If you can read crochet patterns, you'll see it says chain 17, skip the chain closest to the hook and single crochet in each remaining chain and turn. And then we simply chain one and single crochet across. Again, if you don't know how to crochet, that might not mean much to you, but if you do, you're ahead of the game and you know what we're doing. But the one thing that isn't included in written patterns is making the slip knot. Whether you're working with a hook or you're working with your hands, more often than not, we're going to start by putting a slip knot in our yarn. That creates a little stable loop for us to begin with. So before I start making the slip knot, are there any questions that I can answer on the yarn itself? Nothing at the moment. Okay. Um, a lot of compliments, which I can share with you later. Okay, well, thank um, you very much. 
that if y'all have any questions about the yarn specifically, drop them and then we can return to them if needed. Absolutely. All right. Just wouldn't want to get going. Um, should it be from left to right or right to left? If you are right-handed, you'll be crocheting uh, right to left. If you are left-handed, you'll be crocheting left to right. I am right-handed, sadly. I am only right-handed. Um, I can try and do a couple of the things left-handed, but Primarily, I am sort of stuck right-handed. That said, you can still do these things left-handed. I'm just not not talented enough to really switch back and forth. Sorry about that. So first things first, like I said, we find the end of our yarn. And because this is a great big thick yarn, we want to come in a good foot or so. We want to give ourselves plenty of room to work. Then we're going to basically just put a little loop in it, just like that. Just fold it right over itself. Basically, it looks an awful lot like a, an awareness ribbon is how I always think of it. So we come in and just loop your yarn right over itself, right on the table, in front of you, or on your lap, whatever you've got available. You can see the end's still right there. Then what I'm going to do is slip this little section with the end underneath that loop, okay? Then I'm going to take my fingers and I'm going to grab that little section right there from the top through the loop and when I do that I want to grab onto the cut end and this end that's still attached to my skein with my other hand and sort of between the two hands pull up on that loop until you've got a slip knot that's what they call that's a slip knot and you want your loop to be about big enough for three of your fingers to fit right in there nice and comfortably let's go ahead and do that again great thing about slip knots if you don't like it you decide you don't want to do it you just pull and it comes right back out pretty sure that's why it's called a slip knot so let's do that again we're going to go in about a foot or so make our little awareness ribbon right there you can see there's the end if you need to you can make that loop really big make it a little easier for yourself it's just laying right on top then we slip that end, <clears throat> excuse me, right underneath that loop. Kind of looks like a little pretzel right now. But the main thing is we just want to grab that little section and pull it right up through that loop. You can sort of use your hands. You can see if you pull down on the different parts, you can make, you pull down on the tail that's cut here. We can shrink our loop. If you want it to be a little bigger, you can pull back up on it. This is a chenille yarn. That's what this sort of yarn is called with this real fuzziness to it so sometimes you have to use a little bit of muscle power to pull that through there it's not a super slick yarn but you can keep adjusting the size of that loop until it's just right for about three fingers to fit inside that loop so since we've got a lot of beginners here i'm going to make sure we do this one more time we're going to come in about a foot make our little loop there make it nice and big so you can see we've got our cut end right there Slide that right underneath. Grab that and pull it up through. The smaller you make these loops, the tighter and more solid your blanket will be. It'll also be a little bit stiffer, something to keep in mind. Um, one of the reasons when designers create a crochet or knit things and sometimes you see it kind of being loose and lacy, that's to create that drape. Um, drape is sort of the flexibility of the fabric, if you will. So. You can absolutely make smaller loops if you're working. I saw somebody ask if you're using a six bulky that you, they have on hand. I would definitely go down to only two fingers if you have to use a six weight yarn. Um, for a seven, for now, let's go ahead and stick with three while we get the hang of it. And then definitely you can play with this, pull your stitches back out, pull your slip knot out, and definitely play with it and see what size loops you make to like to make and uh, what size stitches you like to make for your pattern. <clears throat> right now we're only using one ball um, and we'll talk more about how to determine how much yarn for the size of blanket you want to make later. Um, so let's go ahead and make our chains. This is the slip knot. And next we're going to make chains. And chains are sort of the foundation of all sorts of crochet, whether you're doing it with your hands or you're doing it with a hook. And I always tell people when they're learning how to crochet, um, again, whether the hook or hands, you're going to want to practice your chains for a lot longer than you'd think. Practice your chains all night. Practice your chains into tomorrow. And once you've got the chains down, 
then you can move on to the other things. Tonight, if you want to try and follow along and attempt the stitches with me, that's great. But do remember, this will go up on YouTube within the next 48 hours or so, so you can come back, watch the video, and pause and slow down as needed. So we have our slip knot on our fingers here. I might occasionally say hook. I'll try not to do it, but it happens once in a while. This is the end that's attached to our skein. We've got a little bit pulled up here, so it's nice and loose. And what we're going to do now to begin our first chain is we're going to yarn over. This is a really common term in crochet. And what it means is we're going to bring the hook back behind our hand up over the top of our hand. We do not want to go in front of our fingers towards the back. We want to come from the back up over our fingers. That is a yarn over. So right now it's just attached to the skein. I have the slip knot right there, three fingers in that loop, and I want to yarn over. Once that is yarned over, it's just gonna lay right there nice and loose, but I want to use my fingers to pull this bit of yarn through this loop. So to do that, I can try and stick my thumb in there. I can just grab it between my fingers, whatever is comfortable for you. Since you're using your hands, there's not really a wrong way or a right way to pull it through. It's what's gonna be comfortable for you. So you can just reach right in there, grab that yarn and pull it up through. And as you do that, pull it up just big enough to get three fingers in the new loop. What you've made right there, that first loop we made that we've now left behind is one chain. That's our first chain. And as we look at it, you can see it looks a little bit like a V, right? There's our slip knot. That's the top of the chain. If we turn it over, see these are the two loops right here that we just saw from the top of the chain, but in the middle, there's the back hump. We don't like our chain, just like our slip knot. We pull and it all goes away. So let's do it again. We put our fingers right in that loop. And it's okay if you need a little bit more room, push them all the way back to your knuckles there. Whatever is most comfortable for you. So we take our yarn, yarn over. Remember, we come from the back up over our fingers. So if you're left handed, this is one of the few things I can do left handed here. Got my three fingers in there. Same thing. Push it back if you need to. Come from behind, up over your fingers. Then grab and pull through until that loop is three fingers again. And you can keep pulling that out until you feel comfortable with it. I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna switch back to my right hand. We yarn over, grab that loop, pull it through, and certainly just gently pull that up until now it is three fingers size again. And then we've got one chain made. To continue our pattern, if you have a, the one that uh, Renee has linked in the chat, starts with a chain of 17. So we've got one, so now we do it again. We still wanna come from behind, up over our fingers for the yarn over, grab that loop, and gently pull it up and through. Now, if we look at what we've done, there's that loop. I took my fingers out, but it's just gonna hang out right there, don't worry. We've got two chains made. One, there's that V, and two. This, this loop right here, the one we just had our fingers in, this is what's usually called the active loop. It does not count as a chain. So if you're someone with some knitting background and this is your first attempt at crochet, that's gonna be a little bit different. The active loop, the one we're using with our hook or our fingers, does not count as a chain or a stitch. It's just an active loop right now. So right now we've only made two chains. We know what the Vs look like from the top. If we flip it over, now we've got two of those back humps, one right there and a second one right there. So either way, we can count our chains. One, two, let's make a third. I'm gonna put my fingers right back in that loop. See, I just dropped it out. I can just put my fingers right back in that loop. Now, if I had put it down and I wanted to walk away from it for a while, I'd probably pull that loop up really big so that it doesn't accidentally pull out when the kids or the dog run by or the husband decides to help clean up, you know, whatever. Go ahead and pull that loop up high before you set it down. Then when it's time to put your fingers back in, you can just pull right back down on that loop, pull on the end attached to the skein, and just get it comfy on your fingers again. Then we can continue crocheting. We're making our chains, so let's make a few more. We're going to yarn over from behind, grab that loop, and gently pull it up and through. 
So now we've got three chains made. One, two, three. And give those a little tug. Sometimes they want to get a little deformed, and giving them a little tug helps. Straighten them out a little bit better. One, two, three. Let's go ahead and make a couple more. Now, as I say, to make the full size blanket, we would start with a chain of 17. But today, for the purposes of time, since we only have an hour together, I'm not going to try and make a three hour throw. I want to make sure to get over all the steps. So I'm only going to make a couple more here for our little sample. But of course, you can make as many as you like. You don't have to stop at 17. If you want a bigger blanket, you can make more. Let's make a couple more chains, though. We yarn over the top of our fingers, grab that loop, and gently pull up and through. Starting to run through my yarn. There we are. Pull up a little bit more if you need to. Yarn over, grab it, and pull it through. The reason that I'm having you yarn over this way as opposed to doing it this way is because that's simply the way that we do it in crochet. In crochet, you want to yarn over from behind. If you yarn over from the front, that's not the correct way to make the stitches. And I just find that personally, it probably has something to do with physics. I'm, I'm not a physics professor, so I don't know exactly. But I find when you do it this way, the stitch simply lays a little differently. It has some different effects. So we always want to come up over from behind. That is the correct way to yarn over in crochet. Although there are certainly special stitches out there that would tell you to do it other ways. But those are special stitches. We're sti sticking to some pretty simple stitches for today. So now I've got several chains made. Let's go ahead and count those out together. I'm going to give them a little tug. You can see how that kind of pulls those little V's together really nicely. We've got one. There's one. Two. Three. Four and five chains made. So again, you can make as many as you'd like. This is the number of chains you make will determine the width of your blanket. So if you want a wider blanket, make more chains. If you want a narrower blanket, make fewer chains. Um, this particular stitch pattern we're using to make this blanket doesn't have um, what's typically called a multiple. You don't have to have a particular number of stitches. It doesn't have to be an even number or an odd number. It can be any number you like. We just want to crochet until we have what we want for the width of our blanket. After you've got your initial chain here to be the same width that you want your blanket to be, we need to make one more chain that's going to count as our turning chain. So before I move on to that, uh, are there any questions I can answer about chaining? No questions about chaining. There was one and I did answer, but I want to verify with you. So someone had asked if you wanted a bigger blanket with less yarn, would it help to make the loops bigger? Would you have any recommendations of, I think I said, just make a swatch test a few things out. You might be playing chicken, but. <laughs> yeah, I think um, you could probably. Yes, because there, there would be less yarn per square inch, if you will. Um, the bigger the stitch, you're going to have more holes. You're going to have more air. So you will have less yarn in that small space. Keep in mind, the bigger the stitch, the lacier it's going to get. So you can try it out, but uh, you know, definitely give it a whirl um, and see if you like the fabric. Um, like I say, we'll go over, make a swatch. Um, I'll talk about it again a little bit at the end, but if you make a little swatch with one skein and see how much you get for that, I will teach you how to take the math for that and figure out how to turn that into the blanket size you want. Um, great question just popped up. Some of my chains are looser and others are tighter. How do I make them the same size? That's that practice I was talking about. If their chains are a little wobbly, we just pull them back out. If we don't like the way we work, they look, we just pull them back out to where you do like them and start again. You still got that loop right there. You can put your fingers right back in there and make some more chains. That is really what all that practice um, is about. And making even chains is something that most beginners struggle with, both by hand and by hook. So there are actually projects out there, particularly for the you know smaller yarns, that only use chains because it is such a thing that you need to practice so much. So you can use, you know, your lots of chains for people use them for gift wrap or for bracelets. This stuff's probably a little thick. But uh, basically, it's practice, 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 um, and being consistent. 
pulling it up to the same size, getting a feel for the yarn, getting a feel for those loops on your hand and how the stitches work together. And then that's why I really emphasize the yarning over from behind because that will help you keep it consistent too. If you do, you know, this way one stitch and this way the next stitch, they're going to start looking differently. So we just wanna be really consistent in yarning over from behind, over the top of our hand and pulling it through. And then like I say, and it's practice, practice, practice. I wish I had a better tip for that. It's always one of the first questions I get, but alas, um, I too chained for days and days to get the hang of it when I was first starting. So let's see, we've got all these chains made. There's the tops of them. And here's what they look like from behind. Remember we talked about those back bumps. For this pattern, when we go to work back into that chain to start building our fabric, we're going to be working into these back humps right here. So we want to look for that little hump right in the middle when we flip our chain over. This is the V's on the front of the chain. We look for those humps on the back of the chain. I always say, when I turn them sideways, it looks a little bit like a Loch Ness monster. Boom, boom, boom. You can kind of look for those little humps across the back. Those are the parts of the chain. That little hump is what we're going to be working into as we begin our first actual row. This is the chain. This is the width. Now we're going to start making rows that is going to start building the length of our blanket. That'll be how long it is. The more rows, the longer the blanket. So like I say, a really very easily customizable pattern. So once you've got the chains made that you want to use for your project or for the width of your project, like I say, we need to make one more chain. That's going to be the turning chain. This last chain we make is not going to get worked back into. Instead, it's basically going to act like a little ladder that brings us up to the height of our first row. So when we make those stitches, if you remember when I held up that blanket at the beginning, those stitches were pretty chunky. So we need a little ladder so that we can make our stitches nice and even across. If we did not have that chain, it'd be all sort of squinched down at the beginning. We want them to stand up nice and tall. However, <laughs> for hand crochet, I have noticed that when I go to make my turning chains, I'm gonna pull that one out because it's a little wonky. When I go to make my turning chains, I want to make it just a little bit smaller because we're not gonna crochet back into it. And I just don't want it to be really loose on the edge of my blanket. So for my turning chain, I'm going to go down to just two fingers, but I'm still going to yarn over and pull through. Now, right now here on my demo, I don't actually know how many chains I have. I saw that question pop up. Um, in the blanket pattern, it calls for 17, but again, however many you want to practice with today, three, four, if you've got some good looking chains and you wanna keep those and move on, absolutely, that is enough to practice with. So now, this last little V I made right here is just a little bit smaller than the others, but it's going to be our turning chain. So if I flip that over, so we can see from the back, here is that back hump from that last chain we just made. We're going to skip this one because we want to skip this whole chain for our ladder. So we skip the one closest to our active loop, closest to the yarn attached to our skein, and come to the next one. So if you need to turn that sideways, you can. Look at it this way, kind of come from the front. Say there's one V, that one we're gonna skip. Here's the second one. You kind of grab those and flip it over. There's only three strands of yarn in each chain. There's the two that make the V and the one that makes the back hump. So that should help you pick that out. So we've got our little turning chain here. I'm going to go ahead and get three fingers in this one again. Just that little one, that one needed to be shorter, but now I wanna make three fingers again for my stitches. Want to skip that back hump that's closest to the slip knot and go to the next one. You can see I've sort of laid my row out right here in front of me. It's helpful again if you have a little tables or something in front of you, but you can use your lap if you need to. I'm going to skip that one, come to the next one. I'm gonna go under that loop with my fingers that have the active loop on them. So I'm gonna push that back a ways. Make sure it's a good size. Find the loop I want to go into, and I'm going to go under it with those same fingers away from me. So I don't wanna come from behind towards me. I want to go through the chain away from me. So going through the chain, literally, I'm just gonna stick my fingers right under that loop. This might be a little tight. It's okay if you can only get two fingers in there. When we're working into the chain with a hook, this is still a common problem, that the chains end up just being a little bit tighter. 
So if you can only get two fingers in there, it's fine. You can see this is my active loop right here. I went under that part of the chain. If I flip it over, there are the two loops from the top of the chain. So let's go ahead and pull it out and do it again. I have my active loop. I have my turning chain. I have the next chain. I have my fingers in the active loop and I can push that nice out of my way. Push it far back. Pull that out of the way if you need to so you can see. Skip that chain right there. Come to the next one. I'm going to insert those same fingers with the loop on it under that bit of the chain. Only two fingers is fine. Until now I have the active loop and my fingers are stuck into that chain. You can see I'm totally attached now. So now what I want to do is grab that yarn again that's attached to our skein. And you can turn it towards you a little bit if you need to and push, give yourself some room. We're going to take our yarn and yarn over again. It seems like it's not really coming from the back because it's up high, but we still want to come up over our fingers. Then we grab that yarn. You can do it. I like to do it just grabbing it between my fingers. So I'll actually just kind of yarn over one and grab it. You could yarn over two and grab it that way, however you like to do it. But we want to grab that yarn and pull it up through that chain just through the chain and as we pull that up we can get three fingers into that new loop there we are so now we have the active loop on our hook the loop we just pulled up through the chain we're going to push both of those back again make sure they're the same size nice and high we're going to yarn over one more time see i just use that finger there to grab it and I'm going to pull that right through both of those loops. Don't worry, I know I've got some questions coming up. I'm going to do it all again. But that right there is one single crochet. So I want you to take a quick look at it. If we look from the top, there's that V again, just like we were seeing when we made our chains. From the front, it's got two vertical bits right there. This right here hanging out on the end, that's our turning chain. That's why I made that one a little bit tighter so it didn't hang out too much. I want it to be nice and nice and snug against my side. From behind, it looks a little bit different. But don't worry, just like all the rest of our stitches, you just pull back on that yarn and it all comes right back out. There we are. And now we're back down to just our chains. So let's do that again. We've got our chains made. We're going to flip them over and look at them again. We have our active loop, the chain closest to our active loop. That is our turning chain. That's the ladder. So we want to start our work in the next chain after that. So I'm going to put my fingers right back in that loop, get it nice and adjusted. Make sure we skip the stitch closest to our hands, the chain closest to our hands, and come to the next one. You can just find that loop right in the middle. Now, if you have been crocheting along with us and your chains aren't quite there yet and you're having trouble picking out the stitches, but you still want to give it a try, just grab, grab whatever you can find. Grab a loop from that stitch and you can practice the motions. Like I say, it takes practice to get your chains really consistent. So we're going to find that next loop right there or whatever loop you can find. We're going to come under that loop away from us. We want to go right under that loop with two fingers. There we are. Someone's asked, are there two ways of crocheting? I would say yes, by hand and with hooks. But as far as that, there's not really a continental and, um, oh, what's the other one, English, that you have in knitting. Crochet is pretty much by hook or by hand, as far as I know. Uh, unless you want to count Tunisian crochet, but that's getting into a whole different topic. So let's stay on this one. We've got our active loop. And we put our hand right inside that chain. You can see it's just been hanging out here. It's just yarn. It's all stable. We're going to push that back on our fingers, give us some room. Then we grab the yarn attached to our skein. We yarn over, pull that loop up through the loop. There we are. Get three fingers back in there. Make sure it's the right size. So right now, that's our turning chain. This is the chain we've just pulled the loop up through. We yarn over again and pull this loop through both of those loops 
to finish our single crochet. There we are. And sometimes they're a little wobbly when you first pull that stitch through, so give it a little wiggle. And it should straighten out to look a bit like that. So let's continue across and make a few more. We're just going to continue working into each of these chains. We don't have to make another turning chain. We've already got our ladder that brought us up to our height. So we can put our fingers right back in there and flip our work over, flip it around, find that next back hump. See, this is the chain we worked into. This is the next one. I'm right-handed, so I'm going right to left. If you're left-handed, you'll be going left to right. Find that next hump back hump there. And same thing. We're just going to stick a couple of our fingers right into that chain. Yarn over. Grab that little bit of yarn and pull it up through the chain until now we've got two loops on our hand. And sometimes they get a little big. That's fine. Just give them a tug back on that skein. Get them the right size. Then we can push those back on our hand out of the way a little bit. Yarn over again. And this time we pull through both of those loops. Give that a little tug there to straighten out. And now we have two single crochets. We made one and two. And if we look at the top, this is our active loop. We can see those V's again. One and two. These are going to be really important later. Let's continue on across. I'm going to snug up that loop on my hand so it's not too big. Turn my chain over. You can see I worked under this one. So this is the next one right there. So let's do this one a little bit more smoothly, step by step. I've got my loop on my hand. Here's the next chain. I'm going to insert my fingers away from me under that chain, yarn over, and then pull a loop up through the chain. It's called yarn over and pull up. Now we want both of those loops to be three fingers so that they're the same size, two fingers if that's what you're using. Push them back out of the way, yarn over again, and pull through both of those lip loops to finish. There we are. So now we've made three single crochets. One, two, three, or most people like to count from the top and just count those Vs. One, two, three. I will absolutely be showing the turn again when I start row two. But right now I need to pull up a little bit more yarn. Like I say, with this big yarn and these stitches, you'll go through it relatively quickly. So we don't want a lot of tension, which is like a lot of pull on this end. We want it to be nice and loose while we're crocheting. So take your time as needed and pull up some more loose yarn. So let's continue. Time for our next stitch. We look at the back of our chains and find that next hump. Or again, if you're just starting out, whatever you can find that looks good to work into. I'm going to insert my fingers away from me under that loop. Push those back if you need to and make some more room. Yarn up over your fingers. Pull through up a loop through the chain. Make sure those loops are the same size on your hand. Push them back a little bit. Yarn over again and pull through both of those loops. And whatever size blanket you're making for the width you want, you keep doing that until we get all the way back to that slip stitch, or excuse me, slip knot. We don't work into that slip knot, just into the chains themselves. We've got two more right there. What if you run out of yarn? I will teach you how to handle that as well coming up soon. We've got our next chain right here. I insert my fingers into that chain, yarn over, pull the loop up through the chain. There we go. Yarn over again and pull through two. There we are. Put the back on our hand here. We've got one chain here left next to the slip knot. You may have a totally different number of chains than I did. Totally fine. This would make a very small blanket indeed. But we've got one chain left right here next to the slip knot. So I'm just going to put my fingers in there. The one next to the slip knot really likes to be a little extra tight. So if you kind of have to work a little extra harder to get your fingers in there, that's okay. It happens. So now we yarn over again, pull that loop up and through. 
just yarn. You won't hurt it. You can kind of manhandle it as much as you need to here. Pull it through. Two loops on our hand. We yarn over and pull through those two loops to finish the last single crochet for row one. So now we have made, my yarn keeps wanting to get caught on the edge of my table here. There we go. Now we have made row one. It's a really short row one, but it gives us a little bit of height here. So every time we add a row, our blanket's going to get longer and longer and longer. So let's go ahead and start row one, or excuse me, row two. And then um, after we get started on row two, I will be able to go over um, how to finish it off, how to add more yarn, and how to determine how much yarn you need, how much stitches you need, and all that sort of thing. So for row one, or excuse me, row two, we've already made row one. Now it's time for row two. We need another little ladder. Same thing's going to happen. We want to have a little ladder at the beginning so that row two can also stand up nice and tall. So we need to have a chain, another turning chain. That's the real name for it. So let's go ahead and bring that back down to two fingers. We're going to go a little bit smaller for that loop. Remember, are those turning chains? We want it to be a little bit tighter along the side. So we yarn over and pull it through. That's it, just like the chains we were doing before. Let's do that one more time. Just like everything else, we can pull them right back out too. So we'll get a two finger loop on that one, yarn over, and pull that loop through. And we can go ahead and make that one a three finger loop. Now we've got our turning chain, our little ladder. We're not going to work into it, we're not going to crochet into it, but it just gives us the height for our next row. But the problem is, like I say, I'm not left handed, so I can't go back this way. We need to turn our work. So when it's time to turn your work, you're going to want to turn it the same way every time you go to turn it. Doesn't matter which side of your project you're working on, you, you want to be consistent. So the way I always think of it is, you turn it the same way you turn the pages of a book. Here is my active loop. I'm going to just flip it over, just like I'm reading a book. Now, my active loop is back on this side, and I can crochet into those stitches. If you're left-handed and you've crocheted across, it's going to look a little different. It'll look more like these stitches from this side, but visually your active loop will have ended up on this side. Go back a page. Just continue to turn it as long as you're consistent. If you're right-handed, always go to the next page. If you're left-handed, always go back a page. When you turn it consistently along the side there, every time you have to turn for a new row, it's just going to make your sides and edges look a lot better and more consistent. So again, I've got my turning chain there. I've just made one. I've got my active loop. Time to turn my work. I'm going to turn the page just like that. And then I will be ready to begin row two. I can just put my fingers right back in that loop and oop, pull my yarn back behind my work there. So now it's all set up and ready to go again. So were there any questions I could answer before I move on to row two? Oh, did I mute myself again? Can you hear me, Tamara? Yes, now you can. <laughs> yes. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, I am just going through, um, one person asked, could we go over color changes perhaps mm -hmm. or joining a new yarn maybe? Since... I will definitely be showing how to join a new yarn. I, <laughs> looking around, uh, I do have another color around. I can try and put in some color changes here as well. I think even if joining a new yarn, I think that would Okay. Be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I will be getting to that here after we get through that. Basically, the how to crochet part. I want to cover some more of those <laughs> of <course. laughs> questions. Alrighty. So I've got my turning chain. I've got my active loop. Got my three fingers in that loop, and I've got row one all stretched out here in front of me. <coughs> Excuse me. Now you'll remember I really pointed out when we look at the top of that row one, we've got those V's again. If we turn them that way, you can kind of see them a little easier all those V's all lined up for us. So we've got our turning chain. Remember, we're not going to work back into that, but now we want to find that first V right there at the very top. So that will be at the top of that last single crochet you made for row one. And now instead of our sticking our fingers under that one back hump of the chain, we're going to stick them under those top two loops of that stitch. So that's a lot on your hand. You've got the active loop, and you've go, got both of those top two loops from the stitch below. 
So you can go ahead and shove all those right back on your hand, however you need to. Oop. Find that end of the yarn again. And just as before, we yarn over and pull up a loop right under both of those two loops. We want to come back to where we have just the active loop and the loop we pulled up through the stitch. Then we yarn over and pull through both of those loops, just like the single crochets we were making before. There we are. Straighten it all out. You can see now that looks like the single crochet we made before. There's our turning chain on the side. And there is a V right at the top of that stitch. So then we put our fingers right back in there, pull up a little bit more yarn. Now we come to the next stitch. So finding where to insert your fingers um, is usually the biggest challenge at this point. Again, whether you're using your fingers or a hook. So if we look at the top, we've got that V right there. But if we look at it from this side, the side we're seeing it from is the crocheter. Look for that little dark, that little dark spot right there. I was called the little cave. Kind of, we've stitched right here. We're going to come over a hump. There's that next little dark spot, that next little cave. If I stick my finger in there, boom, that is right under those top two loops. So as you continue across, look for that little spot right there in each of those stitches. You can always turn it over and check. Did I get under those top two loops? Yep. Then you're in the right spot. When you get to that last one, it can be a little bit harder to find, but it's still right there. So let's make our next single crochet for row two. I'm going to look for that dark little cave right there. I'm going to make sure the loop on my hand is the right side. It didn't get pulled up while I was talking. I'm just going to go right, right under there. And I can check and see, yep, I've got those top two loops from that stitch and my active loop on my hand. So I can push those back, yarn over again, pull up through the stitch. We wanna keep that active loop on our hand for now. So we've got the active loop, the loop we just pulled through the stitch. So we yarn over again and pull through both loops to finish our stitch. There we are. So that is our next single crochet. Now. There are a couple things that we can do um, at this point to add color or to switch color if we are running out of yarn. Um, let's make one more single crochet. I think I got another request for another single crochet. So let's go in here. Insert our hand right in that little dark spot. Yarn over from the top. Pull that loop up under both of those loops. Got two loops left on our hand. Push those back out of our way. Yarn over again and pull through both of those loops to finish the stitch. Now, generally speaking, with this yarn, I prefer to sew my ends together. But if you wanted to change colors, say in the middle of a row, before you get to the end of the row, there is, an, um, there is a way to do that. Let me grab one more yarn. I have to kind of stand up for a second and grab a different color. Ahead and put that on the plan this evening. Oof. Okay, got it. Alrighty. So basically, so it's quite a question pop up about the turn. The turn happens when we get all the way to the end of the row. So if I wanted to continue in this color, I would single crochet in each of these stitches. Then I would need to do chain one again for another turning chain. Turn, just like I'm turning the page of a book, and work back across. The second row. So what I want to do, if I want to add a second color, is pull up a good length of that second color. If we want to make a picture or a pattern of some kind in our blanket. <laughs> now I've pulled up so much I can't find my end. Where did it go? There it is. Okay, found my end. All right. So if you wanted to change colors in the middle of a row, what you could do Get that loop back on our hand here. I'm going to go find my next stitch. Insert my hand in that next stitch, just like I normally would. I'm going to yarn over and pull that loop up through the stitch. Now I've got the two loops on my hand, my active loop and the one I just pulled up through the stitch. And now what I would do is take my new color of yarn, push these two loops out of the way, 
come in a fair bit. You know, you don't want it to accidentally pull all the way through, but we're just going to basically yarn over, lay this yarn over our hand and finish the stitch with our new color. Then we can tuck those ends out of the way for now and simply continue to crochet in our new color. Find the next stitch, insert our hand right out of those top two loops, yarn over, pull up a loop, there we are, yarn over and pull through two, and continue on like that. That really does give us the cleanest color change. We wanna get all the way through the stitch until we've got those last two loops left on our hand, then yarn over with our new color and finish the stitch with the new color. That creates that loop right there. When we finish that stitch, this was the active loop. So we want that to be in our new color so that all the parts of this stitch are all one color. And now with the contrast, it's actually a little bit easier to see which parts are the single crochet. When we were making this stitch, this was our active loop. We reached into this stitch, pulled up a loop, and then pulled this yarn through that loop and this loop. And that's how we made the single crochet. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and pull this color change out. And we'll do a couple more stitches here with this one. I'm gonna continue on and finish up these single crochets so we can get to some more of those other topics. So let's say I'm just making a teeny tiny little, I don't know, pad for something, something to go under, something in my house. I don't need it to be a full-size blanket or maybe I've just finished a full-size blanket. Whatever it is, when you come to the end of your final row, whether it's two rows or 20 rows or 200 rows, you'll need to finish off your yarn. So when you make that very last stitch, like so, then you'll want to go ahead and cut your yarn because you're going to have that one active loop, right? And if you just left it there, first of all, it'd still be attached to the skein. That's not gonna be very practical, but also it could keep pulling through. So what we'll want to do is cut our yarn. Ooh, there we are. Again, leave a good six inches or so. Actually a little bit longer since this is thicker yarn, I'd go closer to probably 10 inches. And then we take our cut end and we simply send it right through that loop. We give it a little tug and it'll be nice and secure and all held together. Your blanket will be all finished off. However, then there are the ends to deal with. Dealing with the ends for this pattern is kind of the same thing as I would say adding a new yarn. We're gonna use the same technique. So after you've cut your yarn, you want to go ahead and sort of snug it under some of your other stitches. We call this weaving it in. Normally we would use a needle, but with this big thick stuff, we're just gonna use our hands. Just sort of tuck it into your other stitches but then I'm going to recommend you actually sew that yarn end in. And of course, ideally you'll have a matching thread color. This is just what I had available and it's actually a little easier for class if it's contrasting because you simply sew that right in place and then you can trim off the excess. Same thing can be done. This is the reason I didn't pull down on this one too hard. What if I wasn't done, but I simply ran out of yarn, right? We've had a couple people in class that's already happened to tonight. When you've run out of yarn and you want to keep going, what we do, whether it's a new color or perhaps one, you know another skein of the same color, we bring that yarn end back. This could be the end of our brand new skein. For me, of course, it's the same one, but it could be our brand new skein. And we simply layer those two pieces together. Then we take a little bit of thread. I've already got it on my needle here. And then we simply sew those together. And if you haven't had a chance um, to play with this specific yarn yet, as you can see, it's chenille on the outside, but if you give it a feel, give it a squeeze, I can't show you, you have to feel it. There's a little core in the middle that really holds all this yarn together. The great thing is we don't really have to pierce this core, but we wanna kind of get close to it. So simply overlap your yarn ends by an inch or two, whatever feels good to you. And then we're just going to send our needle right through and I've already tied a little knot on the end here but we just want to go back and forth we're not doing anything fancy this isn't any particular stitch basically just sewing those yarn ends together now I mentioned of course it's better ideally if your yarn color and your thread color are matching but the great thing about this technique is that if you pull all your stitches in there really tight it will um 
be pretty well hidden because of simply the nature of the yarn. You know, the thread's going to get buried underneath all those bits of chenille. So after you've simply sewn back and forth several times, you can go ahead and knot that off. You probably want to put a few knots into it, you know. It is a fuzzy yarn. We want it to stay well. And then we can trim off our thread here. Let's set that aside so I don't stab myself later. And now these are nice and tight. You might get a little bit of fuzz. You might want to trim that up just a little bit more, but they are nice and tight together. And now I can continue if I want to and continue crocheting. I've seen a few questions come up about that turning chain, that ladder again. So let's go ahead and with our cut end, we'll take a few stitches here so you can see how that turns out. I'm ready to start a new row. Got my new yarn unattached, so I'm ready to go with my new skein of yarn. So I've got that last loop from our last stitch of the previous row. Remember, I want to pull that down to about two. Yarn over and pull through. It's just a chain. The little ladder is a chain. We call it the turning chain because we make that chain. And then we turn our project just like we're turning the page of a book. And now we're all set up to go right back into each one of those little caves to make our single crochets, just like we were doing before. Find that first little spot there that takes us under both of those top two loops. Get my three fingers back in there. We can put our fingers right back under all those loops. Yarn over, pull up our loop. There we are. Yarn over, pull through both of those. And now we're off and running for row three. So you can add more yarn and just keep going until you have the length of the blanket you want. So that is how you add more yarn and then weave in your ends. Like I say, our first end that we've got still hanging out here, kind of tuck it under a couple of stitches, sew it in and trim off the excess. So before we run out of time, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to figure out how much yarn you are going to need. So when I made the sample that I showed at the beginning of the class, it was 36 inches by 36 inches and it used four balls of yarn. We need to do some math to figure out how much yarn we're using per square inch. So we take 36 times 36 and we get 1,296. We divide that by the number of balls used. So if you made a little square that was 10 inches by 10 inches and you used one ball, it would be 10 times 10, 100 divided by one, okay? Whatever your math is. Because we're not using crochet hooks, we're using our hands, everybody's stitches are going to be just a little bit different size. So there's no right or wrong right here. This is simply what it was for me. So we take the length and the width, multiply them together, and then divide it by the amount of yarn we used. That will tell us how many square inches we can get per ball of yarn. So when I made my sample blanket, I got 324 square inches per ball of yarn. Now, I know that's what made a 36 by 36, but what if I wanted to make a 50 inch by 50 inch blanket? You know, something a little bit bigger, more of a throw. Let's figure out the math for that. 50 times 50 is 250. 250 square inches is what I know I want to make. I know that I get 324 square inches per ball. So I can take those 2,500 square inches and divide by 324 and I get 7.7. .7. Okay, so let's go through that again. If I wanna make a 50 inch by 50 inch blanket, I multiply 50 by 50. It could be 50 times 60, 50 times 20, whatever those numbers are. I'm just keeping it to easy math here. 50 times 50 is to 2,500. I know from my swatch, the sample I made before, that I get 324 square inches per ball of yarn. So I take the square inches I wanna make, divide it by how many I get per ball of yarn. I know I will need 7.7 .7 balls of yarn. Now, of course, we've all been to the store. <clears throat> Michaels does not yet sell partial balls. You'll need to buy eight balls. So you'll always, always, always want to round that up. If you round it down, you're just not going to get the same number of stitches you want. It's always better to have a little bit extra yarn. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Here's an example. Last time somebody asked, 30, what if they want to make a 32-inch square blanket? 32 times 32 
is 1024. I know again from the swatch or sample that I made that I get 324 square inches per ball. So that would be 3.16 balls, which means you'll need to buy four balls. Um, you cannot buy partial balls. That was a little bit of a joke. Sorry, Michael's. Nobody sells partial balls that I know of. Um, you'll need to round up basically when you do this math. Um, round up to four or eight, whatever number you get, you'll need to round that up to make sure that you have enough yarn. So then how do you figure out how many stitches you'll need? thought I had a sheet for that. Here we are. Yes. Okay. So here is the sample blanket that I made. A 36 inch blanket, I used 16 stitches, right? Remember we chained 17, but that last chain was our turning chain. So a 36 inch wide blanket for me was 16 stitches. But what if I wanted to make a blanket that was 60 inches wide? Well, for this project, it'd be pretty simple. I could just go ahead and chain, make that hand chain until it's about 60 inches wide. But what if I really wanted to know the math for it? A little bit more math here. I've got 36 over 16. Let me write it out here again. So 36 inches, 16 stitches, okay? So now I do a little bit of fraction work. I want my project to be 60 inches wide. So I want that on top, just like my 36. So what I'm missing is how many stitches I need to make. To figure that out, I need to multiply across 16, that number, times 60, that number. That equals 960. Okay? Then, after we Multiply here, we need to divide by the number that's left. So 960 divided by oops, 36 equals 26.6, okay? So we have the width of our swatch, the number of stitches we made, the width we want, and we're solving for how many stitches we need. We multiply across this way, 16 stitches times 60, divide by the number that's left, and that gives us our x, if you will. For this set of numbers, that x is 26.6. Now we run into the same problem we ran into with the number of balls. We can't make a partial stitch. We're going to need to make a choice. So you can either round that up to 27 and have a little bit wider blanket, or round it down to 26 and have just a little bit narrower. So this is kind of the choices that designers make, that crochet and knit designers make. When you run the numbers, they're not always going to be round, and you have to make some decisions. Do you want it to be a little bit wider, a little bit narrower? All part of the fun of it. Like I say, for this one, it's pretty easy to just chain the width you want. But if you want to run the numbers first, that will tell you how many stitches. And then you can take the desired size of your project and figure out how much yarn you will need. But it's always helpful to have a bit of a gauge swatch first and then you'll be off and running and you can make this blanket in any size at all so were there any last questions i know i kind of rushed through the end there um, but again this video should be up on youtube within the next day or two and then it will be up there as far as i know indefinitely so you can go back and reference it as needed were there any last questions i could answer renee um, I will just ask this one. Um, if you have to stop and start again later, how do you know which is the top and which is the bottom? Ah, it's that active loop. Um, if you made your chains and you have to leave your chains, you want to, of course, I don't have any chains laying around now, but you want to look for that top V. You remember when we were looking at the tops of our stitches here? You want to look for that V. That's going to be the tops of your stitches. Um, and then, of course, if you're crocheting, you've got that one active loop sticking out nice and big. If you do have to put your work down, I kind of mentioned it in passing before, pull that loop up really big. Or if you really want to be extra secure, one more thing you can pick up here are stitch markers. That's kind of a pale one. Let me get one that's a little bit easier to see here through my hand. But they're basically little plastic um, safety pins. Um, these are sold in Michael's for crochet. You want the kind that open, the kind that do not open are for knitting. But basically, you can take your big active loop. Well, we'll pretend this is the active loop. 
and you can put a little stitch marker in there or through both of them however you can and that will help you hold that loop open as well but with a big thick line yarn like this it's nice and um textured if you just pull that loop up nice and big before you set it down that will go a long way to helping you keep your place Um, and I think that is it. So we'll go ahead and come back to the other camera. I saw a couple questions pop up where to find the video. It will be on the Michaels YouTube channel. So if you're watching it on the Michaels YouTube channel now, hello, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, again, make sure you can use that gear icon to slow it down, speed it up, pause it, skip it, change the speed, and really kind of customize the class for you. But for now, practice that slip knot and all those glorious chains, and you'll be well on your way. So thank you all so much for joining me tonight. Awesome. Again, thanks, guys. And I cannot recommend the functions on YouTube enough. There is a slow down option where you can slow it by about 50%. And that is my favorite. It makes it so much easier to watch. Um, make sure that you tag us with your work um, with hashtag Bake It With Michaels and hashtag Yarnspo, Y-A-R-N-S-P-O. Tell us, you know, if you made any modifications, if you, you know, tried to use hooks, we love to see it. We love to see all the solutions. This is a very modifiable pattern. So we love to see it. And just a reminder that you can find more classes on michaels.com and a recording of today's class at michaels.com slash classes. All right. Night, everyone. Thanks. Have a great night, everybody. Bye.